Please turn your Bibles to Psalm 16. If you're wondering what that bang was, that was my water flowing down. And so um, <laughs> we will see what happens later on. I will do a quick check. Everything seems to be okay. Just don't move the pulpit. Normally I keep my water down there and I take a drink and I thought, oh no, I left it up there. So there you go. Verses number 8 through 11 we're going to read right now. Verses 8 through 11. We began the service with this psalm. David says in verse number 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, and my glory rejoiceth. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell. The, the word hell there is, is meaning the place of the dead or the grave. Neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Joseph D. Carlson was born in April the 7th, 1915 in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to Sever and August Carlson. Nothing particularly noteworthy about that birth. He's a little boy that was born in 1915. As a young man in his early 20s, however, he loved music, and so he began to conduct a dance orchestra, which belted out the fun-loving big, bad, <laughs> big, bad, big band jazz sound of that day. At some point, he heard the gospel, and he received Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. His life changed dramatically. He was filled with a new purpose and a joy that changed every area of his life, starting with his vocation. Joseph underwent training and became a pastor with the Christian and Missionary Alliance, and then a full-time evangelist traveling extensively throughout the United States and Canada. He was also a speaker at conventions and at youth gatherings. He was also a popular radio broadcaster in that day, well known for concluding his weekday programs with an encouragement for listeners to keep looking up. God was doing something in that man's life that he had never planned for. In 1959, at the age of 44, he set out for his first overseas trip with his wife to survey opportunities to preach the gospel in other countries. This trip changed his life and his focus. And it was the start of a new ministry, journeying through countries such as Haiti, Korea, Vietnam, and India. Joe was shocked by the poverty that he encountered. He was especially moved by the desperate plight of countless orphaned children who struggled to survive and had little hope for their future. To help these vulnerable children, he started another ministry called the Mission to Children, and it's still going to this day. Primarily interested in evangelism and missions, he made annual visits to mission fields, and he also served as the executive director of the International Christian Ministries, once again, still going today. I'm sharing this with you because of a simple little poem that he wrote. It's a little song that he wrote in 1939, soon after his conversion. He wrote this as his own personal testimony. It came out of his his love for music, it came out of his experience that he had had, but he wrote this. The song was sung at his evangelistic rallies and in many churches across the world. You don't hear it much these days, but as I've been meditating on this message, that song kept popping up in my mind because I have fond memories of singing this at our church on Sunday evenings and also as, as gospel invitations at, at youth camps that I would attend as a, as a, as a child in the 60s. And at youth meetings, um, we would sing this particular song. And it expresses what we have in God, in Christ Jesus. No, I'm not going to sing it for you today. I'm going to quote you the words of this song. And maybe some of you old timers will remember this. 
If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. He'll, your sins he'll wash away. Your night he'll turn to day. Your life he'll make over anew. If you want joy, real joy, wonderful joy, let Jesus come into your heart. It's significant that he wrote that soon after he was saved, soon after he accepted Christ as the Savior. He had no idea what God was going to do with his life, but it was motivated by the joy that he had in the Lord. Joy. You know, joy is something, is a testimony of those who know God, who experience God in their life. It is characterized by joy. In, 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 in Hebrew language, and uh, it, it, means, it means what it says. It means mirth. It means happiness. It means to be excited about the relationship that you are in or the situation that you're in. We read in, in verse number 11, King David's testimony of his relationship with God was the fullness of joy. Um, Thou will show me the path of life, he writes. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. The person who knows the joy of the presence of the Lord in his life will find joy in other areas of their life. They will find joy in the day. They will find joy in their work. They will find joy in their relationship with other people. They will even find joy in the midst of trouble because their joy is in the presence of the Lord. And another psalm in Psalm 21, it, it, take the time sometime to read that whole psalm and, and you'll see that David almost shouts out in verse number one, the king shall joy in the strength, O Lord, and in thy salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. Psalm 16 is a testimony of a person who trusts the Lord, not just for this life, but for eternal life. In verses 1 through 3, with confidence in the Lord, you will find delight in other people. In verses number 4 and 5, in the Lord you will find your portion and your inheritance, and you will clearly see the contrast that the sorrow is in people who are following the false gods. In verses 6 and 7, you see the good that the Lord gives you as he gives you guidance and instruction. In verses number 8 and 9, as the will of the God is your focus, you are settled, you're calmed, you're secure, you shall not be moved. In verse number 10, the grave is not your destiny. No, no, you go beyond the grave because in verse number 11, you have found the path of eternal life. And that is in the presence of the Lord. There's joy in the presence of the Lord. There's also a, a clear reference um, here. This is also a messianic psalm. There's a clear reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The apostle Peter quotes this portion of the psalm and he makes the application in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. And over the last few weeks, as I've been picking out different psalms, um, you've seen that. In every single psalm, there's something that you can apply to Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to read this for you, and from verses 24 to 28, in the midst of his sermon as he's um, talking on the day of Pentecost about why they are gathered there and the, the gospel, he says, whom God, speaking of Jesus, whom God hath raised up, having loosened the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaks concerning him, and this is when he refers to this psalm. And he says, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, and I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope, because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to seek corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full with the joy of thy countenance. And then Peter in his sermon, 
brings it to the point where he says to them, where, where they say to him, what shall we do? He says, repent. Repent. He encourages them to receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And he refers to this joy, this fullness of joy that a person can have. You've heard the term, the joy of the Lord is my strength, haven't you? Yeah, it's a phrase that we often hear. Do you know where it comes from? It comes from the book of Nehemiah. I'd like you to turn to the book of Nehemiah. And if you're wondering where that is, just turn left just a little bit in your Bible. You're in the Psalms. And so just go back a couple more books and you'll get the book of Nehemiah. And we find that phrase here. We're going to have a look at it in its context. And then you're going to understand why we said amen when we read the scripture. In Nehemiah 8, we find here that the, the, they've gone back to Jerusalem after the 70 years of captivity. The people, the, the walls were built and then they were in disarray and and the people were living out in the in the um, villages around them, and they had, they had pretty much given up on it, and they had lost hope. And God raised up Nehemiah to come, and he built the walls back up again. I think you know the story. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful um, illustration of leadership, godly leadership. And as they built those walls, before they put the, the gates back on there, of course they had the problems with, with the, with the other people around them that did not want those walls to be built. The people were going through the motions. They were being, um, if you will, they were actually being um, ripped off by their own people. They had mortgaged their lands. They had, they had gone into debt. They, they did not know which way that they were going to go. They did not see much of a future. And they were complaining. They were sad. They were weary. They were weeping. God brought Nehemiah onto the scene. He brought others as well, like Ezra, the scribe. And there was a day then he told them to bring out that book of Moses again. Bring that out. They had found that in the rubble. And they brought that out. And the book of Ezra um, speaks about that as well. And then they took that together and they brought it up. And look at verse number three. And it says, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning till midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. Ezra then, as he gathered the people together, and they would meet each day, and they would stand all morning long, from the morning until noon, and they would break up. He, he, he built a pulpit. He built a pulpit of wood. And all he did was read from the book of Moses. And then the, the priest and, and the others would, um, it says in, in the other verses there, especially in verse number um, seven and so forth, that after he did this, the priest would sit down and they would break up into groups. <laughs> and then these would be the Bible study groups. And they would take those portions that Ezra had read from that pulpit of wood. And they would go and he would say, Here's what this means for you. The book of Moses that he was talking about was the first five books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And the people had been so far away from the book of God for so many years that they had forgotten who they were. They had forgotten the plan that God had for their lives. And so he would gather them and they would do this. But look at verse number six. Ezra blessed the Lord. He blessed the Lord, the great God. And the people answered, Amen. Amen with lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The first reaction that these people had from the word of God coming to them is an act of reverence and repentance. And they fell on their faces before God. But they said, we, they found out that God was speaking to them. They saw that God had a plan in their life. And then we find that, that as the people did this, they stood in reverence for hours. And as they began to actually understand what the word of God was saying to them, they began to weep. 
They begin to cry out because of the lost opportunities that they had had. They begin to see the waste that they had done in their life up until now. The trials that had not turned them back to God, but had actually accumulated. And it burst forth in an emotional response. First of all, it may have started out just, just small groups here and there. And then collectively, it just grew and grew until we get to verse number, I'll read verses number 8, 9, and 10. So they read in the book of the law of God distinctly. And they gave the sense and they caused them to understand the reading. And here's their reaction. And it says, um, um, go down in verse number 9 to the, the second part of it. When um, Ezra shouts out, he says, This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not, nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink the sweet. Send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The day of mourning has passed. The day of weeping is gone. For joy comes in the morning. He says the proper response to this is, is, is true, is to repent. It's true that we should see who we are. We feel sorrow and we feel difficulty in circumstances and we wonder where is our joy going to come from? Will we ever see it back again? You know, remember the joy of the Lord is your strength, believer. It is the joy that God has for you. It is the joy that you will have when you are in his presence. Hebrews 12, 2 tells us that Jesus endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. You know, the joy that was set before him was redeemed people. In Zephaniah three seventeen, it says that God rejoices over us with singing. Can you imagine that? He rejoices over you and me. We as Christians have access to God's boundless joy. It's a joy that does not come from our circumstances. It certainly doesn't do that, does it? It doesn't come from within ourselves. It cannot be manufactured. This joy comes from God and God alone and the relationship that we have with him. So how can you access God's joy in your life? In Nehemiah 8, we see that their joy was realized because even though they had this knowledge that caused them to have sorrow, that sorrow also gave them direction. 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us, and I'll paraphrase this, it says that, that godly sorrow will bring on repentance. And that repentance will bring change in your life that you will never have to regret. It will that that worldly sorrow will only bring death. It will only bring destruction. You're constantly having to say sorry all the time. But in godly repentance or godly sorrow, it brings a change in your life. We saw that with the one who wrote that that little hymn or that little song. If you want joy, real joy, let Jesus come into your heart. You know, changing lives and following God's ways will give you a deeper joy than you could ever have attained on your own. We found that here in Nehemiah. In fact, if you continue to read Nehemiah, you will, you will discover that, that they, God didn't leave them here. Later on, as they enjoyed um, each other now because they knew that they were the people of God, they were giving gifts to one another. Uh, they, they, were, they were celebrating the fact that they were together in the place that God wanted them. They, they enjoyed now the situations. Just a few chapters before, they were complaining. And now they're actually seeing God at work in their lives. God's preparing them because as they continue to study the word of God, the Bible tells us that it comes to them that there, there's feasts that they had not been doing. 
So he says, we're going to go back and we're going to dust that off and we're going to go back to worshiping the Lord the way he told us to worship. Then they found out later on as they were reading and as they were studying this and, and getting the understanding that there were, there were places that they were not supposed to be. There were, there, were, there were separation issues here or sanctification issues. And they did it because they knew that the joy that they had in the presence of the Lord could not be duplicated in their own activities. They had to be in the presence of the Lord. So they were more than willing to do it. You know, it's the same for us today. When you and I know the truth within the pages of the Bible, God will give you a joy in your life and an assurance that helps you to prepare for the next step. That's why our church um, has adult Bible studies. That's why we have Sunday school. And that's why we have men's Bible studies and fellowship groups. We don't just have fellowship groups. We have Bible studies with the fellowship group. That's why the ladies' meetings are, are surrounded not just because of the fellowship, which is very, very important, but it's fellowship based on the foundation of the Word of God. And so they're in, in practical lessons of the Word of God. We, take, we have a biblical discipleship course. If you haven't been involved with that, I want to invite you to take it. We have a few people who are going through that right now. And this builds your faith to give you the joy that you have in the Lord. We have also several good Bible study booklets, sound study tools that you can use to take that step. Because like the Israelites, we can hear, we can believe, and we can study the word of God, but we must put it into practice if we're going to experience the joy of the Lord. And so there are some ways I'm going to share with you right now. They're very simple. And there's, there's five of them. You may want to jot them down. Um, the, the first one here is, and they're, they're all fairly obvious when you think about it, because the first one is that we think clearly or meditate on the word of God. Recall how the people responded to God's law in Nehemiah 8. He, Ezra was just reading it. But it wasn't until after they began to think about it begin to apply it. He said that they, they read it distinctively. They were made to understand it. They allowed God's word to penetrate deep into their souls because that's where it can change them. While you're studying, don't just read or say the words. Ponder the words. What do they mean in their context? How can they be applied to you? Go deeper. Keep a, keep a specific verse in mind for the day and dwell on that verse. Um, in the last two weeks, I've been thinking about that. The joy of the Lord is my strength. I've been thinking about that for a couple of weeks now. And I'm thinking about some other ones for, for the next few weeks. It's opened up my mind. It's opened up my heart for this next area that I'm going to talk about. Because as you meditate on the word of God and as you see this, then look for how God is working in your life. That's number two. Look for how is God actually doing his work in my life right now? Consider the gifts he's given you. Count your blessings. They're there. Um, look for how he's working in your life during your ordinary activities. As you do this, the level of your joy will increase because you'll see how God cares for you. Yesterday, um, Gavin and I uh, came here. And we, we met here early. Not that early for a Saturday, but we met here. And we, we set up some microphones. And we, we did some things. And we both ride motorcycles. And, and we had our motorcycles out there. And I said, let's go for a ride. So, so we did. And we meandered on up. And we, we had a cup of coffee. And he ate a muffin. And I ate some carrot cake. But that's beside the point. And then we, we kept riding, and we, did, and we went to, to, we went to um, Jin Jin, and then we, we rode down through Bullsbrook, and we, we went through the Chittering Valley and all this. And, and we, I enjoyed every bit of it. The company was good. It was. But it was also the fact that, that we were able to enjoy what God has given in the activities that we do. We found ourselves at the end of the, 
as we, we waved and beeped and said, but I, I went away feeling good, feeling satisfied. Understanding that the level of your joy will increase when you see how God is working in your life. He does it through people in your life. He does it through the circumstances of your life. And you will, you'll, you'll really understand it when you see how much God actually cares for you. Remember, Jesus told us that God cares for those little sparrows. So he will certainly take good care of you. And as you focus on the working of God in your life, the more you will learn about him, the more you will learn that you can trust him. It says in, in Psalm 16, verse number one, preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. And based on that, he was able to, from, from verse to verse to verse, develop that prayer and that poem to where he ends up saying that will show me the path of life. In thy presence is the fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. How, would, how is it that David knew that? He knew that because he began by putting his trust in the Lord. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusts in thee. Number three. You're, 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 you're waiting for this one. Number three. Learn to pray consistently and constantly. You may be thinking, well, I really don't know how to pray. I, I was with you up until that point, Pastor. But you're now saying that I need to have a prayer life if I'm going to have the joy of the Lord. Well, yes. There's not a person who has the joy of the Lord who isn't a person of prayer. And if you don't know how to pray, well, Christian, you better start learning. Because that is the key to knowing the presence of the Lord in your life. This is not an optional extra. This is not some religious duty. This is like breathing. Every time you face a difficulty, ask God to deal with it. Keep up a conversation with him going all day long. Talk to him about how you're feeling. Talk to him about the, the trials that you're in. Through the Holy Spirit's dwelling in your life, he will Help you face it. You will find the joy in the communication of the Lord. Our Lord gave instructions in prayer when he gave us the pattern of prayer. And we saw that when we looked at the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 especially. We see in the Lord's Prayer. And that is not a prayer just to memorize. It is a pattern to emulate and to have as part of your, your, your constant worship before the Lord. Get a prayer partner together. Get involved in one of our groups. You say, you're really pushing the groups, Pastor. Yes, I am, because that is how you grow in the Lord. You see, our, our groups are involved with fellowship, revolved around the Bible, and involved with prayer. There's times of prayer in every single group that we're in. That is because you find joy in the Lord when you learn to communicate with Him. It's an important feature. Number four. Finding joy in God means letting him be in control of your life. Now, you've heard that a lot, haven't you? Let God be in control of your life. That sounds very idealistic. So how does one actually do that practically? I just gave it to you. The first three points. Meditate on the word of God. Look for the way God's working in your life and what he's doing in your life, even at this very moment. The situation that you're in right now. Learn to communicate with him in prayer. And as you do these things, God is taking control of your life. You are renewing your mind. You are submitting to his word. Recognize and give up your, 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 um, your control measures that you have. And we all have them. We all, we all like to be in control until we find out that there are certain things that we cannot control. And then embrace the things that God has empowered you to change in your life. There are some areas in your life that ought not to be there. And you say, well, look, I will deal with that at a time. 
No, those are the changes that God has encouraged you and, in fact, commanded you and has empowered you to change in your life, just like he did with the Israelites. Under Nehemiah's leadership and Ezra's spiritual guidance, they rose up and they made, if you keep reading, very, very significant changes in their life that God patiently worked with them and wanted them to change. I'll give you an example of what I mean by that. On Sunday evenings, we um, before the lockdown, and I finished it up a couple weeks ago, we considered the power that words have in our life and the, the effect that words have in other people's lives. We discussed that on Sunday night. And one particularly important lesson that, that really hit home to me is the words reveal the attitude of our hearts. What comes out of our mouth is not an accident. It actually reveals who we are. Therefore, as we surrender our thought life to the Lord and what we're thinking about, the things that we contemplate, the things that we're concerned over, we find that our priorities change. That means that God is actually taking control and it affects what comes out of our mouth. There are some things in life that cannot be changed. Perhaps they shouldn't be changed. In these situations, we remember what Peter said to us. He says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting your care upon him, for he cares for you. There's a small plaque in my office. And it reads this. It's apparently an old preacher's um, statement that he makes every time he gets up in the morning. I've had this plaque since I was a young preacher, but now I'm an old preacher. So I can understand what it means. Lord, help me to remember that nothing is going to happen to me today that you and I together cannot handle. The Lord will be with you. And now you're ready for this next one. This is the big one. Begin doing that next thing in your life. Begin doing that next step. You know what it is. You know what it is because you've been meditating on the word of God. You know what that next step is in your life because you've been seeing God working in your life. You've been praying. You've been contemplating. Now we got to take that next step. Would you surrender the control of your life to the Lord? Purpose to do something about it. Use that calling that God has given you, the gifts that he's empowered you with. Stop sitting on the sideline. Get up and do something about what he is doing in your life. Then rest in the Lord and you will realize the joy. For example, I've got, I've got three of them just real quickly here. Practice the guidance of the Lord in your life. In verse number 7, he says in Psalm 16, I will bless the Lord who hath given me counsel and my reins. The word reins there means the things I think about. My mind also instructs me in the night seasons. Take care of your body. Look after yourself because it is the temple of God. When you're tired and when you're stressed, that's when, that's when you, you can think you can Blow things out of proportion. Paul recognized that in the Corinthians, and he said that most famous passage. He says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? For you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. They belong to God. They're his possession. And number three is when you're physically, mentally, and emotionally drained, don't rely on that to dictate your relationship with the Lord. These people, as they were standing there day after day, listening to the word of God, were emotionally strung out. They were tired. They were at their wit's end. And he said, the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is where you're going to get your strength from. Paul knew, knew that. And he's got a word from the Lord where he says, 
My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Elizabeth Elliot, a well-known name. She was born in 1926, and she passed away about five years ago. She was an inspiring Christian author and a speaker. That's how we knew her. Her first husband, however, Jim Elliot, was killed in 1956 while attempting to make a missionary contact with the Alpha Indians in eastern Ecuador. Elizabeth was his wife. She later spent seven more years as a missionary to the very tribe members who had killed her husband. Years ago, Elizabeth Elliot popularized a, an old poem, a common sense simplicity with common sense simplicity and clarity. It encourages many anxious and weary saints. And I like to close with that poem. It's called Do the Next Thing. From an old English parsonage down by the sea, there came in the twilight a message to me. Its quaint Saxon legend, deeply engraven, hath, it seems to me, a teaching from heaven. And on through the doors the quiet words ring like an old, low inspiration. Do the next thing. Many a questioning, many a fear, many a doubt has its quietening here. Moment by moment, let down from heaven, time, opportunity, and guidance are given. Fear not tomorrow's child of the king. Trust them with Jesus, then do the next thing. Do it immediately. Do it with prayer. Do it reliantly, casting all care. Do it with reverence, tracing his hand, who placed it before thee with earnest command. Stayed on omnipotence, safe neath his wing, then leave all the results and do the next thing. Looking to Jesus, ever serener, working or suffering, be thy demeanor. In his dear presence, the rest of his calm, the light of his countenance will be thy psalm. Strong in his faithfulness, praise and sing. Then as he beckons thee, do the next thing. You and I want the joy of the Lord in our life. Elizabeth Elliot was at the low point of her life when she received word that her husband had been killed by the very people that they had sought to bring the gospel to. And with little children in tow, she was at the point where she had to do the next thing. And that next thing could only come from the strength that she had from the joy of being in the presence of the Lord. Let's all stand together. Lord, we pray and we praise you. We meditate on your word and we learn from you. We look out in the situations that we're in and, and in, in, the, in the, the, the work that we're doing, the people that we live with, and we see you working in our lives. We're learning, Lord, to give the control of our life over to you in the very things that we do. And, Lord, we're learning to learn to do the next thing. Lord, there may be somebody listening to this right now who is following after the false gods, the gods that bring them sorrow, and they're living under the circumstances, and they believe that life gives them all the ability that they need to to succeed, and they find that they're failing. And Lord, I pray that they will turn to you now, and they will admit that they need Jesus Christ in their life. Lord, from there we pray that you'll open up their hearts and their minds to the word of God that promises that if they believe in you, that you died on the cross, that you were buried and you raised from the dead for their justification, they will be saved. And I pray that they will call upon you now, Lord, I pray that they will seek more information. They will seek to grow in you. Lord, we pray that your word would return back to yourself, Lord, in lives that are changed as we saw in the examples that we talked about this morning. And Lord, as we lift up our voices to you in this closing song, I pray that we will 
determined that we will do that next thing that you're telling us to do as we meditate on you, as we look to you, as we pray to you, and we gather together and worship you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.